Okay, hello everybody and welcome to tonight's edition of Astronomy on Tap. Coming to you remotely from various uh, homes. Uh, I'm just going to switch to, this should be on speaker view. Assuming you can hear me. <laughs> I'm not sure why I, I just see Liz up in the corner. Um, okay, so welcome to tonight's Astronomy on Tap, a special edition uh, for King's Day, a uh, bit of a different celebration, but I hope you can all join us. With something orange, a glass of beer, or your favorite drink. Uh, to come listen to some astronomy tonight. Uh, tonight we have uh, two speakers uh, talking about fast radio bursts and gravitational waves, um, but we'll get back to that in a moment. So happy King's Day. Here's the, the windmill of Leiden all dressed up. Um, so just briefly, uh, what is Astronomy on Tap? If you're one of our regulars, you probably already know this. Uh, Astronomy on Tap started in New York City in 2013, seven years ago, and has spread to over 40 locations across the world. Uh, we at Astronomy on Tap have been running for just over three years now, uh, every last Monday of the month, usually at the Bucht, but we're coming to you live um, online at the moment. So tonight, the special King's Day edition, just to introduce who's, who's online with you. Uh, I'm Wendy. I'm just going to be doing the hosting tonight. Uh, we have Marta, who's going to moderate the questions. Uh, I'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, we even have games tonight. Uh, hope that all works. Uh, and Liz is providing tech support. Sorry, Anika is doing the, the games. Uh, and our two speakers, Emily and Oliver. You'll see our faces at various times tonight. Um, just to note that you can leave questions in the live chat on YouTube. Uh, you can write them during the talk if something comes to you while the speaker is speaking. Uh, this also saves time right at the end so that the questions are already there for the, the moderator to, to ask them. There's a little bit of a lag sometimes between us and what you see uh, on YouTube. So this helps us with that. Uh, and also just let us know if you're watching, uh, talk to us. Um, tell us where you are uh, and say hi, share something, some pictures of you maybe, or of your drink or your favorite meal, uh, and uh, just let us know you're watching. We are on various social media, obviously on YouTube tonight, you've already found that. Uh, you can also check out our, our website, Astronomy on Tap and Tunnel. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, uh, and Instagram with the, um, the tagline AOT Leiden. Uh, and if you want to get more information, you can email us at astronomyontapleiden at gmail.com. We have a newsletter that goes out. Okay, so first up, we have just two items of astronomy news, something exciting and interesting happening. Um, the first thing is uh, the telescopes of ESA, in particular, the very large telescope has been observing the stars around the, the center of our Milky Way for, for many years, for over 30 years. Uh, and slowly over the years, the, the precision of the observations has, has improved a lot. Uh, and we've actually observed the, the individual orbits of different stars around the, the black hole in our galaxy. But just recently, the, the orbits of one particular star has been seen to be precessing in this kind of um, rosetta shape instead of just a single elliptical orbit. And this is directly predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity. It was first observed in the, the motion of Mercury many, many years ago. Um, and has, this is the first time it's been seen uh, in the orbits of stars around a black hole and not just our sun. So this is really exciting news. Uh, another thing, uh, if this will play, uh, there is a, a joint Japanese-European mission that is going to uh, Mercury. Oh, unfortunately, this is not playing the video. Um, you can maybe see the, the image here of just a single snapshot, a little bit faded out. 
Uh, this mission called uh, Bepi Colombo is on its way to Mercury. It'll take seven years to get there, passing first the Earth and then Venus, and then a few times swinging by uh, Mercury in these so-called uh, gravitational slingshot assists to either accelerate or break the, the spacecraft. And Bepi Colombo just this month uh, passed around the Earth on its closest approach uh, to head off towards uh, Venus. So if you want, you can follow this URL later on uh, or just search for Bepi Colombo flyby. There's a really great uh, animation uh, showing the Earth flashing by uh, Bepi's view as it's traveling at over 100,000 kilometers per hour. But that's some exciting stuff in the news. Uh, tonight we have uh, two speakers. We also have our quiz. So starting up the program will be Oliver uh, talking about gravitational waves. We'll then go on to a quiz and just so you know what's happening and the, it's not a technical glitch, we will have a short break in between. You can refresh your, your drink or go to the bathroom quickly. Uh, and then we'll return give the answers to the quiz and then move on to our, our second speaker, Emily, who will be talking about uh, post radio bursts. Uh, so first up, we have Oliver Bosma, who is a PhD student at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, he's, been sorry, he's been researching the collisions of these very small, very heavy stars known as neutron stars, or actually the end products of uh, stellar life. Uh, and when these uh, stars collide, they actually produce ripples in the space-time that are known as gravitational waves, which were only recently detected for the first time. So he'll be talking about some of the story of the history of um, gravitational waves. Uh, an interesting fact about Oliver is that he's recently started playing darts. I don't know if playing is actually the word. Uh, maybe you can tell us, Oliver. Uh, he's taken up arts, darts, uh, which is something he's been really interested in. Uh, the only problem is his bedroom wall is suffering. Maybe you need a bigger dart board. So over, here, over to you, Oliver, uh, to talk about gravitational waves. Oh, not the quiz yet. We're just going to switch over. All right, let me share my screen. Decision. All right. So, hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in tonight on the King's birthday and what better day um, to talk some science. So today I'll be telling you about listening to the universe through gravitational waves. And so the main thing I'd like to bring across today is that we found a new way of observing the universe. So before we were detecting gravitational waves, we were observing the universe through the use of light rays or also known as photons and these light rays um, they cover a broad range, so they come from radio waves to the light we can see with our own eyes to gamma rays. And so in this time, we were still deaf to gravitational waves. We were only seeing photons. And so now, um, as of five years ago, we we're also able to listen to gravitational waves. And so these gravitational waves, they are not sound waves, so they do not move to air, but they move the space and time around us. So these are small perturbations in the space and time around us that we're now actually observing. And so what I call listening to. And so I'll be coming back to this analogy a few times in this presentation. So first, a little bit about me. Here I am still with her. I'm Oliver Boersma. I was born in Amsterdam. Then I moved to Nijmegen to study physics and astronomy at Radboud University. Now I live in Utrecht, which is where I'm talking from now. And I work as a graduate, graduate student at the University of Amsterdam together with Yuri van Leeuwen. And as Wendy kindly told all of you, I work on the collision of neutron stars. And um, with relation to the dart, you mostly throw the darts, but I think you play the game of darts. Hopefully that clears up the confusion. All right, let's move on. So I've divided, divided this talk into three sections. First, I'll be talking about the history of gravitational waves. Um, where they come from, and of course, um, Einstein's theory of relativity. Then we go to the present, and I talk about how we detect these gravitational waves um, and what you can do with them. And then I'll also go into a little bit um, 
into the future of gravitational wave science and the detectors that the future will hold. So this story starts all the way back in 1905, which is known as the Anus Mirabilis, the miracle year. And in this year, Einstein published four papers which would change the course of modern physics forever. And the third paper is called, uh, is about special relativity. And in this theory, Einstein states that time is relative. So he refutes this notion that, for example, Newton uses that time is absolute and the same for everybody. And instead he says that time is relative and depends on where you are and how quick you're moving. And together with this notion, he introduces a new concept of space-time. So instead of saying that space and time are separate quantities, um, Einstein actually says that space and time are very much um, intertwined and they form this kind of fabric that permeates all the way throughout space. And so special relativity only deals with space times that are flat. And it took Einstein 10 years to um, actually also introduce gravity into special relativity. And what gravity does, or what Einstein says that gravity does, is that it is a curving of space and time. And so what we know as gravity is actually this curving of space and time. And so then what causes this curving of space and time? Well, everything that has mass. If you, for example, look at our, at our own sun, our own sun is very heavy. And so this um, heavy sun introduces this curving of space and time. And through this curving of space and time, our Earth moves in an orbit around the sun. In the same way, our Earth is also rather heavy. So it also introduces this curvature in space time. And then this causes our moon to orbit around the Earth. Besides our own sun, there are many different objects which cause this uh, curvature of space and time, everything that has mass. And for example, a neutron star, which is a very heavy, very tiny star, causes an even uh, bigger curvature of space time. And then we also have black holes. And black holes are basically like holes in space time. So they cause a, an incredibly uh, large curvature of space time. And we'll be looking at gravitational waves that come from such neutron, neutron stars and black holes today. So a concept that kind of naturally arises if you have this curvature is that maybe waves can also exist in this curvature. Well, if this curvature is caused by gravity, as Einstein say, says, might there exist things known as gravitational waves? Well, Einstein uh, quite quickly said yes. And so Einstein came up with the idea of gravitational waves, which are ripples in the fabric of space-time. Um, so here we see a visualization of such a gravitational wave. And so such a gravitational wave essentially stretches and squeezes this fabric of space-time that permeates throughout the universe. And this stretching and squeezing, when these gravitational waves arrive here on Earth, is 100 times smaller than the size of a proton. So that's eight times 10 to the minus 28 meters. So that's really an incredibly um, small perturbation of space time, almost too small to imagine. Um, it wasn't a foregone conclusion that these waves would actually exist and that they're not just some mathematical, mathematical concept um, dreamt up by Einstein. So it took a lot of very intelligent physicists like the Polish physicist Leopold Infold the British one, Felix Brani, an American physicist, Howard Robertson, and of course, everybody's physicist, favorite physicist, Richard Feynman, to discuss um, all throughout the 20th century, the existence of these waves. In the end, they came, came to the conclusion that they exist. And then of course, the question arises, can we measure them? So a very important indirect measurement um, of gravitational waves came through the Hull-Stainer binary. binary. So these are two very heavy, very small stars known as neutron stars, which orbit each other. One of the neutron stars is also a pulsar and a pulsar also emits radio pulses. So while these two stars are orbiting each other, they are also emitting gravitational waves. And because the, the system emits gravitational waves, it loses energy and that then causes these two stars to move closer and closer together. And this decrease in separation and you can measure this through measuring these radio pulses. And that's precisely what Hulse and Taylor did. And so this decrease in their orbit, you can see here on the right. And if you then go to uh, general relativity and predict um, how much of a decrease in orbit you would see through gravitational wave, you can see that this line exactly measures, uh, exactly fits the measurements of Hulse and Taylor. 
And so this was a very important indirect observation of gravitational waves to this seeing of the photons of the radio pulses. Right, so if we then go on to the present, um, we are now actually able to directly listen to these gravitational waves through the LIGO detectors. And these um, are two detectors in Hanford and Livingston. These are incredibly large detectors. They have two arms perpendicular to each other, which are four kilometers long, and they use lasers to measure these very tiny perturbations, these gravitational waves here on Earth. So what do these uh, LIGO detectors actually detect? So they detect gravitational waves from two neutron stars which orbit each other and then collide, but also from two black holes which orbit each other and collide and merge. So how does it actually look like? Well, hopefully you can see it. This is a simulation of how these gravitational waves look when these two neutron stars or black holes orbit each other. And in the beginning, when these gravitational waves are made, they are very large, but they travel a long way to get to us at, uh, on Earth. And by the time they get here, their amplitude, so their size has decreased a lot. And so we have to be very careful if we want to detect this, and this is a very um, difficult endeavor. Still, we have managed to do that, and that is through these detectors I, detectors I mentioned, the two LIGO detectors. And so here I'll go quickly over how these work. These are very complicated, but the basic principle is they have two arms which lasers are shot to. And so you have these two black holes, they orbit each other and they emit gravitational waves. And then when these gravitational waves pass through Earth, um, one arm of the LIGO detector I think, Oliver, that we have a problem with the sound. Yes, all right, now we can continue. Sorry about that. So, so um, we can now continue, sorry about that from this slide. All right, so if you are able to measure this difference in arm length of the two LIGO detectors, you are actually measuring gravitational waves from either black holes or Newton stars. And it's important to remember that these um, perturbations, so these differences in arm lengths are very, 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 very tiny. So um, that's why you have to build these huge detectors to measure these tiny changes. All right, so moving on. In 2015, we detected the first gravitational wave, which we um, call GW, which we call GW 150914. And we can see the detection here on uh, the left. And so we have these two black holes, which circle around each other. They, um, and then they eventually merge and the gravitational waves from this merger we have detected here on Earth. We can see here um, in orange, the LIGO Hanford detection and in blue, the LIGO Livingston detection. Some fun facts about um, this uh, merger. This merger happened more than 1 billion years ago. So an incredibly long time ago, right before the merger of these two black holes, they were moving at a speed of 180,000 kilometers a second per second. So that's almost two thirds the speed of light. The final black hole that came from this merger has a mass that is 65 times the mass of the sun, but it's only 180 kilometer big. So it's really, 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 um, really dense object. And a normal computer would need around 5,000 years to analyze the data that comes from these LIGO, um, that comes from uh, these LIGO detectors. Am I still uh, online? Okay, good. So since GW 15.914, a whole zoo of gravitational wave detections um, has been made. And here we can see, hopefully you can see the movie, all these different types of black holes with different uh, masses and sizes orbiting each other and emitting gravitational waves 
which we have detected here on Earth. Furthermore, we have also detected gravitational waves from two neutron stars orbiting each other, which is the GW170881. Um, and so here's an overview of all the black holes that LIGO de has detected and also one neutron star. And the interesting thing is, is that we're detecting a whole new type of black holes with LIGO, which, are, which have masses which are much heavier than the black holes we have detected with photons up until now. And so this is very interesting because this can tell you a lot about the evolution of stars, where these black holes come from, and also how general relativity behaves in the presence or really, really nearby, um, really close by these black holes. We have also detected um, a couple of double or ex one um, double neutron star merger. And when you detect gravitational waves from a double neutron star merger, this can tell you a lot about how these neutron stars look from the inside. All right, so what does the future hold for gravitational wave detection? Well, first and foremost, more detectors. So we have the two detectors in America, LIGO Hanford and LIGO Livingston. Um, we also have two detectors in Europe, GO600 in Germany and the Virgo one in Italy. And certainly the Virgo one is also detecting gravitational waves. And so in the very near future, we'll be adding Kagra in Japan, Japan to the detector network and also in I believe 2025, LIGO India will be added to this detector network as well. And what um, more detectors allow you to do is much better pinpoint the location of these gravitational waves on the sky. And this is very useful for a host of things in gravitational wave science. Uh, in the very far future, we'll also be sending a detector to space, which is called LISA, the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. And with LISA, we'll be able to detect gravitational waves that come from our own Milky Way from two white dwarfs orbiting each other. Um, that's a fascinating instrument and that will be launching in the 2030s. And then back here on Earth, under the ground, um, a new detector will be made, which is called the Einstein detector. And this uh, detector has even longer arms than the LIGO detector up to 10 kilometers. And this allows you to detect black holes and neutron stars that are even farther away than the ones we are detecting now. Um, and so a couple of other things I'd like to highlight is that we'll be able to detect more exotic sources of gravitational waves in the future as well. For example, those that come from right after the Big Bang, which we know is primordial gravitational waves, and also gravitational waves from supernovae, so massive star explosions. And one thing that I'm really excited about is that we're gonna be able to listen and see at the same time. So that means that we'll be using the gravitational wave detectors, so LIGO, Virgo, LISA, and Einstein, in conjunction with more regular types of telescopes like uh, the Westerbork radio telescope here on Earth. All right, uh, that concludes my talk. Hope you, hopefully you find it interesting. And back to you, Wendy. All right, thank you very much. That was a very interesting talk. Um, we have a question here from Alex Critlin. He, um, you mentioned in your talk that gravitational waves are large at the source. So um, he's asking if you were on a planet orbiting a neutron star binary, would you notice the gravitational wave without a LIGO-like detector? Without or with a LIGO-like detector? Without. Ooh, I don't think you will be noticing anything if you orbit a neutron star very closely because the gravity at that point is so intense that you'll be probably ripped out apart like a string of spaghetti. So if you orbit um, a neutron star with your planet, you won't be detecting anything, I suppose. Mm. So um, I had a question if um, how close to, for example, a neutron star merger, would you have to be to uh, be able to um, hear or feel this gravitational wave? Hmm. I'm not sure if you would actually be able to feel them without getting completely ripped apart yourself. I don't think that's possible. So I think you have to be really far away not to get ripped apart by these neutron stars orbiting each other. And then you can use detectors such as the LIGO detector to actually measure the gravitational waves from such a system. OK. Um, so Tuanan uh, is asking, is the main reason the arms have to be so long, our ability to measure time accurately? 
And yeah, the main reason that these arms are so long is that the differences you are measuring are incredibly tiny. And so um, these arms, if you want to measure really tiny differences, you better make sure that the length that these labor lasers travel is really long, because then, um, how do I explain this correctly? The longer, basically the longer this, these arms are, the easier it is to detect tiny differences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Aranka is asking, does it matter that the current LIGOs are located on the Northern Hemisphere only? Will data be affected or are gravitational waves measurable anyway? That's a very good question. So in essence, these detectors are omnidirectional. So they can detect um, gravitational waves from all across the sky, but they certainly have a preference towards certain areas of the sky. And so if you have detectors on multiple places on the earth, your overall sensitivity on the sky to gravitational wave improves, improves a lot. And this also allows you to pinpoint where these gravitational waves precisely come from, just like you need a couple of um, satellites for GPS to work properly. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think that's all the questions we have for now. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Oliver. Um, very briefly, uh, I'm back. Uh, we're now going to go over to a quiz. Yay! For our regulars, you'll probably be happy that we're doing uh, games again. Uh, so Anik is going to take over, um, I think. Yes. Great. Let me just share my screen. You have to stop sharing. Yeah. Yes. Zoom. OK. Welcome, everybody. So indeed, we're going to go have some games again today. So today we have two small games for you. Um, and already you could have seen in the, uh, the chat on YouTube that there is a Google form. So also there's a link here at the bottom of the slide. So it's very important if you want to participate in the games that you go to this Google form and fill out your answers here. Um, only if you fill out also your email address we will be able to contact you in case you are the winner of the game, because then we'll have a nice present for you. Uh, so please do participate. And um, yeah, so like Wendy already said, we're going to have the game now, and we're going to have a quick break, and then we'll be back for the answers. And in the end, um, at the end of the other talk, uh, Wendy is going to announce the winner. So I'll give you a few seconds to open the Google form. Hopefully that all works and please give me a shout if it doesn't. Okay, so the first game that we're going to play is called Black Hole Hunter. Can you recognize the gravitational wave signal in the noisy signal? So this game is actually very related to the talk that Oliver just gave us. Um, so just a little bit of background. So like Oliver already told you, uh, when those two black holes or two neutron stars merge, uh, we actually have a sound coming off those uh, like this merger um, and the frequency goes up and up more and at the moment that they actually merge there's actually uh, a sound they make that we detect with LIGO. So in this game we're going to go see if you can also catch those gravitational waves. So here we see them going and we can see that they start orbiting into each other and when they come closer and closer, actually in the bottom plot, you can see that the frequency is going up. And then at some point we'll be able to hear the gravitational wave. But the biggest problem, of course, is all the noise. So when we try to detect those gravitational waves, there is so much more noise on Earth by maybe all other types of things um, around us, like for instance, like a truck driving above LIGO, um, that it's actually very hard to hear those gravitational waves. So this is what a noisy detection sounds like. Yeah, I hope you could all hear it. 
So it actually sounds like a whole lot of noise, but there's a signal in there. So this is the signal that you heard. Yep. So that's the, the gravitational wave. That's the two, the merger, um, which I actually think is really funny because this is one of the most violent events that happens in the universe. And it doesn't sound very violent at all. So we're going to start the first question now. So I'm going to let you hear six different uh, sounds and you're going to have to guess if there is a gravitational wave hidden in the sound or not. So this is the first one. I'll play it one more time. Nope. Okay. That doesn't seem that easy. Sorry, I'm going to have to start this up again. Nope. Okay, sorry, I'm going to have to, I think, stop sharing this. Okay, I think I'm going to do it like this. Now it works for sure. So this is the first one. And I also don't hear the sounds. Okay, sorry guys. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and start oh. it again. I also don't hear Wendy. Oh, you do hear it. Okay, cool. <laughs> Perfect. Then I'll start sharing it again. Then, for some reason, it's just me not hearing it. <laughs> okay. So the second one. And then we'll go on to the third one. Let's see if you can catch that gravitational wave. The fourth one. Number five. And number six. Yep. So I hope you all got that. Did it work for you too? Okay. So fill out your answers in the Google form and then we'll go on to the second one, the second game. So the second game we're gonna play is called Dutch Stellations. So here we actually see an image or a picture of our king, Willem Alexander at the Astronomy Gala, which was only a couple of months ago. And here he's surrounded by some famous astronomers and he's getting um, some lectures and they're talking to him about astronomy and I think he had a really great time. So especially for him, we have this Dutch astronomy game today. So in this game, the question uh, that you're gonna have to answer is the following constellations form the, the shapes of typical Dutch things. Can you guess what they are? So we're going to show you seven different Dutch stellations and you're going to have to guess what they are. And usually the answer is just one word. In one case, it's two words. So just fill out uh, your answers in the Google form and then it will be checked for you. So this is the very first Dutch stellation. What do you think this is? So we're looking for typical Dutch things. Then we'll go for number two. This is a quite famous one. Then number three. So here you're gonna need some imagination, but we already helped you a little bit by drawing some lines. And then we're gonna go to number four. 
This should also be familiar to many of you. Then we're going to have number five. This looks like quite a hard one. Then number six. And then last but not least, number seven. Okay, so I hope you recognized all those Dutch things. And just in case that multiple people have the same amount of correct answers and we have multiple winners, we have a tiebreaker question. And this tiebreaker question is actually already a warm up for your next talk. And the question is how many fast radio bursts or FRBs occur per day over the entire sky? So if you click another time next section on your Google form, you will see this tiebreaker question. So fill out your answers. Uh, so fill out a number and the person who is closest and uh, is also like tied for the winning spot will be the winner today. So fill out your tiebreaker question. Um, the Google form will be open for a few more minutes. So we're gonna take a five minute break now. Um, it's gonna be closing in, in a few more minutes. So um, yeah, please share your answers and then we'll be back with you soon. So during this break, I will just quickly go over them again. So you can still check if you got the correct answers. So we're going to go over the different sounds and the images. I still can't hear this myself, so I'm not sure if it works. <laughs> it doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> then we're just gonna go to the Dutch dilations. Great, thank you, Anik, for taking us through that. Um, so we'll be back again in a few minutes. We're just going to take a, a short. Please break all now. go grab a beer. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, and we're back again. Um, hopefully you can all hear me again. Uh, so sorry about the slightly glitchy uh, glitches. Um, this is our first time doing quizzes, but I think uh, you should have all heard the, the um, well, the noise or the not noise or the signal. Uh, and those Dutch constellations were really hard. Um, so we'll see the, the answers now, right? Okay, so back to Anik. Yes, I'll start showing you the answers. So I closed the, the Google form. So unfortunately, it doesn't accept any more of the answers. So there we go. Okay, so the first game, can you recognize the gravitational wave signals? So the first one, I'm going to just try it again. Let's see if it works this time. So the answer, no, no gravitational wave, just noise. Then the second one. Again, doesn't work for me. So I'm just going to assume that maybe it works for you. So here, we did have a gravitational wave. And actually here we see a figure where we see the noise and the signal. And the, the signal here is kind of strong. So hopefully you could hear this pretty clearly. Then number three. There was again, no signal, just noise. And number four. There was a signal. But this time the signal was a little bit less strong than the first time. So hopefully you could also hear this one. And then number five. There was again no signal. And then the final one, number six. Also again, no signal. So uh, we'll go see soon if you're a good black hole hunters. And uh, this game was actually based on this website, blackholehunter.org. So if you want to hear more of the universe, then uh, please go to this website. Um, it's really fun, so you can play around there. Then the answer for the second game, the Dutch Dilations. So this very first one, I thought this was a pretty hard one, but this was actually cheese. So I hope you all got that. And then the second one, the pretty famous Dutch tulip. So the thing that we're all missing right now, actually today I saw a little video of the Keukenhof and it looks pretty nice with no people there. Then number three, the thing that all Dutch people have is a bike. Pretty essential in the Netherlands. Then number four, this Dutch dilation are clucks or klompen. So actually the Google form and like Dutch and English was both fine. So it all should have worked out. And then number five, also a pretty hard one. This was the windmill. And then number six, this was the Dutch cow. And then Last but not least, number seven, it's what we're all here for today, is a nice Dutch beer. And especially for you, Heineken is also one of the right answers. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, we're gonna go back to Wendy now. And then in the end, after the second talk, we'll announce the winner and we'll also announce the answer for the tiebreaker question. So let's see. If I can find my mouse, yep. Okay, Wendy, back to you. You're still muted, Wendy. 
Thanks for telling me that, Anik. Otherwise, I would never have known. Uh, I certainly missed a few of those typical Dutch stellations. Uh, clearly, I'm not properly Dutch yet. <laughs> so our next talk tonight will be by Emily Petrov, who is a uh, postdoctoral fellow, actually an NVO Veni fellow at the University of Amsterdam also. Uh, and she works on finding and understanding these mysterious astrophysical transients that are called fast radio bursts. Uh, quite what these are. She's going to tell us a little bit more about these. These didn't actually exist just a few years ago. Uh, and Emily is one of the founding members of this really new and exciting field that has gone from no detections to a uh, starting to be a, a significant sample of them. Uh, so she'll introduce what they are. Uh, they seem to be quite common. Uh, she'll talk about what we don't know and what we do know and some of the, the journey along the road of, of understanding these things. Uh, an interesting thank, a fact about Emily is that she has a, a corgi named Delta uh, and she can often be found walking or throwing tennis balls for her doggy, who is very cute by the way, uh, the, the corgi that is. So over to you, Emily. Thank you. Yep, okay. So let me get my talk up and running. Okay, yeah, and apology ants if my dog ends up barking during this talk, I fully expect it, but we will see. <laughs> um, all right, so. Uh, Right. Can you see my presentation? Okay, excellent. Um, great. So thank you so much, everybody, for being here and for um, having me at this uh, at this event. So I was pretty excited to prepare this talk and um, uh, to, you know, they told me to give like a sort of, you know, nice introduction to, to the field or like just something fun about my work. And um, as I was preparing this talk, I actually realized that the most fun thing I could talk about was not really um, you know, in the 15 minutes that I have was not necessarily um, everything about fast radio bursts because there's just too much to cover there. So I actually decided to change up like my talk as I was writing it. And now I'm going to tell you something about um, the time that I didn't find fast radio bursts because I think that this is actually like quite a fun story as well. <laughs> but we will do some science, of course. I do want to start off by talking about fast radio bursts because they're fun and interesting. Um, if you're not familiar with them at all, um, I feel like it's my duty to tell you a little bit about them. So what are fast radio bursts? Um, well, that's an excellent question. Um, we don't actually quite have an answer for that, but I will tell you to the best of my ability. So this is essentially what a fast radio burst looks like in our data. Um, you can probably spot it in this plot. This is just our um, intensity from the telescope as a function of time. And that um, really bright spike is the fast radio burst. Um, so we see these as basically, you know, a tenth of a millisecond to about 10 millisecond long bursts of radio emission in our data. And um, that's incredibly short, one of the shortest types of astronomical transients that we know of. So they're, they're basically a um, hundred times faster than the blink of a human eye. And we catch these with our, with our telescopes. Um, they are coming from billions of light years away, um, we think and they are hugely energetic. So just based on how far away we think they're coming from, uh, we think that these bursts have to release more energy in this 10th of a millisecond than the sun does in an entire day. So um, these are really incredibly uh, extreme events. Um, and if you are looking for the answer to the tiebreaker question, we think that there are something like 5,000 FRBs that happen over the entire sky every day. So that's uh, millions of FRBs every year, one every approximately minute of the day is happening somewhere on the sky in some galaxy. Um, and this is just an incredible new sample of things. We've only really known about them for a, a decade or so. Um, and maybe what you're wanting to know about is where they come from. Um, so I will tell you they're caused by, um, well, we don't actually know. And this is one of the biggest open mysteries in this field. Uh, we do know of about uh, 500 or more um, FRBs that have been found by telescopes around the world. Unfortunately, only about 100-ish of them are published so far, but we're working hard on getting the rest of them out um, to the public. 
but you can find all the ones that are published on this catalog that I run called the FRB catalog or FRB cat. Um, but as, as to what does cause them, there are many, many theories. <laughs> um, I would say there, there used to be more theories than there were fast radio bursts. Now we've finally surpassed the number of theories. Um, but there's still something like 70 or 80 theories for what could be causing them. And a lot of them focus on um, young or energetic neutron stars in other galaxies. So Ollie told us already a little bit about neutron stars. Um, these, young, these very, very dense leftovers from stellar explosions. And it turns out that um, a lot of people think that these things might be coming from, from neutron stars, but uh, we still are not quite sure. Um, you can check out the entire list of uh, theories for fast radio bursts on the FRB theory catalog. So we're very, we're very into catalogs in this field. Um, so you can uh, check them out at the FRB theory cat. Um, so that's a very brief introduction to fast radio bursts. There, it's a very, like, it's a very up and coming field. It's super interesting. I like, I, I could talk for hours about it. Um, but one of the things I think is quite a fun story about how this field got started, um, because I've been there since like almost the beginning, is this really great time about the, the, the time that I didn't find fast radio bursts. Um, I was definitely trying for the majority of my PhD to find fast radio bursts, and I was uh, moderately successful. But this is kind of a fun aside. So um, the story starts with how with the story of fast radio bursts, which is to say in 2007, which is when the first fast radio burst was discovered with this telescope, the Parkes telescope. And um, we were originally looking for radio pulsars in the Milky Way. But in doing that, um, my colleague, Dunk Lorimer stumbled across this signal that looks like this. And um, this is the very first fast radio burst, which we also call the Lorimer burst. And um, the signal lasted about five milliseconds. So it's very typical of the durations of, of FRBs that we know of. And the thing that really stood out to us about it is, um, you know, this data set doesn't really have to mean a lot to you, but there's this, uh, you can see the signal as a function of frequency across this, we observe over a bandwidth and you can see it here. And um, we see this type of uh, uh, sweep in the signal for anything that's coming from space. So any astrophysical physical signal should have this sweep because it tells us something about the distance to the source. But the slope of that sweep tells us specifically how far away this thing may be coming from. And in the case of this, uh, this Lorimer burst, which is what we called it originally, in the case of the Lorimer burst, it appeared to be coming from just so far away that it couldn't possibly be from the Milky Way. Um, so it really appeared to be like the very first astro um, extragalactic radio pulse that we'd ever seen. And this got us really super excited. Um, and so my colleague Dunk, this is him here, um, said it was unlike anything that we had ever seen before, um, which is was very exciting. So um, what do you do when you find something that's unlike anything you've ever seen before? Well, um, you crunch as much data as possible to try to find more of that thing. So it would be really nice if uh, our data analysis was like this, where you just press one button and then it's all done. Um, but this during my grad student days, it actually ended up looking a little bit more like this, where you're just kind of frustratedly looking at about a million plots on your computer screen. And in doing this, um, one of my colleagues, Sarah Brooks Valor, who was a PhD student um, before me at Swinburne, um, she was looking through some old data and she found a signal that looked kind of like the lorem reversed. Um, so this is this is the signal that she found, and we got really excited because um, it has somewhat similar characteristics to the Lorimer reverse. It's a pulse in the data, and um, you see this sort of frequency sweep. It's quite patchy, though. Um, but what was really interesting and weird about this signal compared to the original Lorimer reverse detection is that um, with the with our telescope, we normally observe several pixels on the sky, and each of these pixels is uh, spatially separate. So um, if it's a true astrophysical signal, you should see it in one pixel and maybe a few neighboring pixels if it's really super bright, like the Lorimer burst. But this particular signal was actually found in all 13 pixels that we were seeing on the sky at once. And this is not typical of an astrophysical signal. This is typical of something like uh, interference from uh, you know something nearby. But um, we weren't really familiar with anything that could make this like frequency sweep like we see for astrophysical signals. So this kind of muddied the waters um, of what these sources could be. And Sarah called these, this, this particular type of signal that she was seeing, she called them paratons, um, which is a very interesting and weird word. Um, and if you wanna go look it up, the, the, the sort of like uh, 
official of what a, what, a, what is a periton it's a, some sort of like winged animal that uh, you know is not what it appears to be so it's a, a bit of a red herring um but uh comparing these periton signals with the original Lorimer burst was quite an interesting exercise because you can see um the two compared on the left you see the Lorimer burst and actually on the sky you see the pixels and it was really just in these three pixels on the sky whereas with the periton it looks somewhat similar but it was in all 13 pixels at once so if you can get something that's clearly interference from nearby that makes a signal like this, it makes you kind of start to question the validity of the Lorimer burst and maybe an extra galactic radio pulse was just too good to be true. Um, and so we all got a little bit disappointed for a while. And, um, you know, we, we started to lose, uh, lose a little bit of faith as a field, I would say. Um, but then, um, you know, we, we, things, uh, things were started to look up. We were in, from 2013 to 2014, we started finding more of these Lorimer burst like signals at the Parkes telescope, but we found more paratons along the way. And so this was getting a little bit awkward actually, because it was good that we were finding more things that looked like the Lorimer burst, but they were only found at Parkes. And so you're starting to get a little bit nervous that maybe this is everything is just a uh, it's just a local phenomenon at the parks telescope um but we got even better news in 2014 when the very first non-parks fast radio burst was found at the arecibo telescope in puerto rico so this is as far from parks as you can possibly get this is a good indication that um, these signals are indeed astrophysical we can you know breathe a little sigh of relief and um, move on with our lives so we now have that uh, you know, there's this population of extragalactic energetic radio bursts. We've seen them at Parks and Arecibo. Um, but then there's these other periton things that we see at Parks and we sh shouldn't have to worry about them anymore because they're clearly interference and they're not like the fast radio bursts. Um, so this is kind of where we were at 2013 to 2015. This was like a pretty exciting time to be doing a PhD in this field. Lots of lots of exciting things were happening with fast radio bursts. We were finding more of them at parks. We started to find them at telescopes like Arecibo. We started find I found the first uh, fast radio burst in real time and followed it up with a whole bunch of telescopes around the world. Um, we started finding more FRBs both in archival data and in new data, and we started finding them with things like the Green Bank Telescope. So more telescopes, more fast radio bursts. Really good time to be working in this field. Um, and. So I was really excited during my PhD. I kept coming up with these brand new results and bringing them to my PhD supervisor and you know showing him these things. But every time I would bring him a brand new result, he would you know he'd, he'd say like yeah 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 okay. But what about the paratons? Um, so this is my PhD supervisor Matthew Bales, and um, he was uh, you know so this was this was really on his mind. This was bothering him, and it, rightly so because um, you know if you can't fully explain away the paratons, um, how can you be totally confident in these in the validity of these fast radio bursts? So the breakthrough here really came in 2015 when we started finding not just fast radio bursts, but also paratons in real time. So I was looking through the data as it was coming off the Parkes telescope. And, um, you know, I was looking at it. I found one week in January of 2015, we found three new paratons from Parkes. And so this, you know, finding them in, in such, with such low latency meant that I could go back to the telescope staff and say, OK, we just found all of these paratons. What was happening at the telescope yesterday? And, uh, you know, the park staff could come back and say, you know, we're not sure, um, but you can check the interference monitor. And I could come back and say, that's great. What interference monitor? <laughs> so it turns out that at the end of 2014, um, the park staff had, in had installed a monitor at the telescope to um, be able to basically just take a census of what type of interference was happening around the telescope at any given time. And this ended up being super important to finding out the source of the paratons because this interference monitor looked over a large range of radio frequencies. So you can see on the x-axis, this is the entire range of frequencies from this monitor. It's from like 0.5 gigahertz up to like 3 gigahertz. And the shaded region from around 1.1 to 1.5 is where we normally observe in our um, astronomical observations. So they were taking a much wider view of the of the interference environment at the site than we could possibly get with our with our normal data. And what we found is that at the time when we saw a really bright periton at the telescope, um, outside of our normal observing band around 2.5 gigahertz where the arrows are, there was a really bright spike of emission. And um, we never would have seen this in our data if we didn't have this monitor. And uh, so this was a big uh, red flag for us immediately because, um, you know, if you're familiar with the radio spectrum at all, 
lots of electronics operate around 2.5 gigahertz or give off emission at 2.5 gigahertz, like um, cell phones, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, um, all of these types of things that should not exist on the telescope site. But um, we were seeing this bright spike at 2.5 gigahertz. So maybe uh, it was time to start checking all of the electronics on site to see if they were responsible for these paratons. So uh, the other piece of data that we actually were able to, to get was that we were, we were finding lots more paratons in old data as well. And so we were able to also look at where the telescope was pointing when we saw these paratons. And um, so this is like an aerial view of the Parkes telescope. And what we found is that for the most part, when we saw paratons, we were pointing in one of two directions. Um, uh, one of which actually is uh, on the left is the visitor center. And on the right is um, like the staff shed where people um, keep all of their stuff and uh, where, where the, the, the staff actually like do some of the electronics work. So this was a huge breakthrough. We were thinking, okay, so it's definitely something to do with people on site. Um, but now we had this large sample of, of paratons that we found so we could look at their distribution, not just in terms of spatial distribution, but also time distribution. And um, so I started plotting up, you know, the time of day of these things. So we could compare them to the fast radio bursts. So this is just the FRBs that we'd seen at parks up to this time. And as you would expect, FRBs do not care about time of day. Um, they are from space, so it should not matter what time of day you're observing. But um, the paratons really cared about what time of day we were, uh, what time of day it was. And in fact, if you uh, corrected for daylight savings, the, uh, this peak actually tightens up around a very obvious time of day, which is in the noon to one um, lunch hour. <laughs> and um, it became very clear with all of this information um, that the paratons were coming from uh, microwave ovens. So uh, we, it, we did several tests to try to get microwave ovens to produce paratons. And it turns out that you can produce a paraton at the Parkes telescope if instead of letting the microwave finish its cooking cycle, you open the door to stop it. And just in that tiny, tiny fraction of a second, while the microwave is still running and you break the Faraday cage, a little paraton pops out and you can detect it with a very, very sensitive radio telescope. So you shouldn't really worry that this is like dangerous to your health or something like that. It takes a very sensitive instrument to find these things. Um, but it turns out that you can make uh, this nice little signal with, uh, with a microwave oven. So every time you uh, pop the door open to get your lunch out early, um, you, are, you are producing a paraton. And actually this is very nice because if we revisit this plot of the uh, locations of where we were looking, turns out there are two microwave ovens on the parks site and they are located here. So <laughs> we were very confident that we had actually solved the mystery of where these where these paratons were coming from, which was extremely satisfying as a scientist because um, then you know my PhD supervisor says, okay, but what about the paratons? And I can come back to him and say, you know, no worries, they're just microwave ovens, and um, you know we can get back to our real science and get back to FRBs. Uh, so. Just, you know, this has, this has a very happy ending because now we know exactly where the paratons are coming from. We have this growing population of fast radio bursts that we see over the entire sky with now we have more than six telescopes around the world that are finding these things at, a, at an increasing rate. And I can say that FRBs are definitely 100% real and <laughs> that paratons are coming from microwave ovens. And, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's case closed. So, you know, just to, just to kind of sum it up, um, I think there are definitely um, some joys of finding something that you weren't really looking for. Uh, the first one is that this was possibly like the most fun detective work that I've done as part of my research career. Uh, it's very like, it's very concrete, very hands-on compared to, you know, normal astronomy work. Um, we're much more confident that our FRBs are real now than if we had just ignored the paratons and left it as some sort of unsolved mystery. So I think this is good science to be doing this. Um, this is actually also my most downloaded and read paper of all time. This is the third most downloaded paper off of the physics archive. So um, it's got like a wide appeal. People really enjoy it, it seems like. Um, this is an example of how real science happens. You, you know, you, you, have, a, you have a question, you have a hypothesis, you start, you start testing it, you start um, looking at samples, like, you know, you start collecting data and analyzing it. And hopefully at the end you get a very satisfying conclusive answer. Not always, but sometimes. And of course, uh, it makes for a great story. So this is a story that I like to tell, but it was a story that journalists also really like to tell because um, you know it's not often they get to talk about you know astronomers being like baffled or stumped 
or I guess my favorite, the detecting the cosmic microwave oven background. Um, so this is just kind of, it's, it's a really fun little, little like story about, it's a story within a story about the field of fast radio bursts. And uh, there's lots of things that I can tell you about FRBs themselves, but I thought this seemed like a really fun story to share. Um, and just to give you a glimpse into the, like sort of the early days of this field and, and um, some of the questions that we've been answering. So thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Emily, for that great talk. I think people have now learned not to open the door without pressing stop ever again for a microwave. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a question here from Nick. Um, it, um, they want to know, how can you see from how far the FRB is coming from, from the signal that you get? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the... Um the amount of delay that you see in that signal that I showed. Um, let's see if I can, uh, um, I'm not sure if I can go back to my, my other slides, but let me, um, here we go. Um, so the amount of delay that you see uh, in the signal, uh, this guy, um, so this, the slope of this line um, tells you something about how many electrons the pulse has interacted with and basically gives you sort of a proxy for how far away the signal has come from. And so if this line were um, much steeper, like if the slope of this line were much, much steeper, you'd say it's gone through many more electrons. And if it were much, um, and if it were much flatter, then you would say, um, you know, it hasn't interacted with that many electrons. So you, um, you use information about this delay across a bandwidth that you're observing to tell you it's not the exact distance, but it gives you sort of a proxy for like how far away it may have come from. It's not precise by any means. Um, to be precise, we need to actually pinpoint the galaxy that it comes from and then get a redshift for that galaxy. But um, we've only been able to do that for like a handful of FRBs so far. Great. Um, this coder uh, is asking what origin do you think they have personally? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think that there are probably, it's probably just neutron stars. Um, it's hard to say whether it's going to be something like a young neutron star that's just giving off flares, or it's going to be a young neutron star that's interacting with something else. Um, but we've so far, um, we've seen a few fast radio bursts now that repeat. And um, we've seen one fast radio burst that repeats in a sort of like a cyclical way. And so it's quite possible that these, um, if they repeat, it ha can't be something that explodes, obviously. So it may just be these, like, it may be flares from a young neutron star that's interacting with some, uh, with some, like, stuff in its environment. Um, but all of this is happening in galaxies sort of billions of light years away. So, and they have to be fairly common. If there's, like, 5,000 every day, neutron stars are fairly common throughout the universe. So it wouldn't surprise me if it ends up being just something to do with, um, somewhat extreme neutron stars in somewhat extreme environments relative to what we have in our own Milky Way. Mm -hmm. um, Veronica May Williams is asking if there have been any other Earth-based items that you have seen on the radio signals on the telescopes. Mm. For in terms of the observing that we've been doing with uh, for fast radio bursts, we definitely see a lot of interference from normal things like satellites, airplanes, um, cell phones and stuff like that. But in terms of more like fun, you know, mystery signals, I would say in, in observing fast radio bursts, the paratons are really the only one. But there have been other signals in the past from other observatories, like um, if you go back to like the 70s, there's the wow signal that was this like very bright, unexplained radio signal. Um, and there have been other examples of sort of unexplained or like kind of uh, red herring signals that have been found in uh, astronomical data in the past. Um, but for the most part in the data that we're that we're looking through for fast radio bursts, it's a lot of like um, normal human, human, human generated radio interference from kind of boring things. <laughs> um, Tuanan is asking if there have been, uh, if any FRBs have been detected by more than one detector. Oh, that's a very good question. We're trying very hard. Um, yes. Uh, actually, just recently, I would say um, the first uh, examples of FRBs that have been found, um, the same pulse found with multiple telescopes at the same time. Um, 
it's quite hard to do because you need to be observing at the exact same time um, at the exact same place. And even then it's kind of, if you're looking across different radio frequencies, it's hard to say with absolute certainty that they're the same pulse. Um, but yes, just in the past couple of months, there's been, um, there was a paper where they observed with this uh, two telescopes in uh, North America, CHIME and uh, the Green Bank Telescope. And it appears that they found the same, see the same pulse from uh, that was detected at the, the two telescopes basically at the same time. Um, but uh, yeah, so far the majority of fast radio bursts that we've seen are really just detected at one telescope and then maybe followed up and seen to repeat with another telescope. But the exact pulse has only been seen with just the one telescope. Mm -hmm. Um, Yevedeve wants to, is asking, how can a physical process of large objects produce such a short signal? Is it a beam that sweeps across us? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, in order to be uh, uh, only a few milliseconds long, this, this signal has to be coming at maximum from an emission region that's like a few kilometers or hundreds of kilometers across. So some, something very small. Um, on the surface of a neutron star or something like that. So it could very well be that it is be it's something that is beamed. So um, it could be a beam that's sweeping across the sky or it could be some sort of like maser-like emission where you get a very narrow pencil beam that just happens to be pointed directly towards us at the right time. Um, and uh, yeah, or it, it could just be a much, a, much larger, um, a much larger opening angle, but essentially the time scales um, and, and the energies work out that it probably is something that's somewhat beamed, um, but whether it's sweeping across or it's just targeted at us is, uh, we still don't really have enough information to say for sure yet. Okay. Um, Hina is asking if uh, these FRBs are from our galaxy or extragalactic and how do we know that? Yeah, great question. Um, so they appear to be coming from other galaxies. Um, there have been some theories that put that uh, try to um, put them in in our own galaxy. The issue really is that um, the signal that we pick up, we are um, the signal encodes information about all of the electrons or like all of the material that the burst has interacted with along the along the path from the uh, uh, the emission space, like from the source to the observer, and. Um, just from the FRBs that we see, it looks like the amount of material that that burst has encountered is just too much material to explain from the Milky Way, um, from the material in the Milky Way of our own galaxy. Um, so that's just from the observations in the radio. But we've now found um, upwards of 10 fast radio bursts that have been localized to, to specifically very pinpoint localized on the sky. And there we actually have identified their host galaxies. So we know exactly what galaxy they're coming from. We know for sure that they're extragalactic and those galaxies are billions of light years away. So that, um, that already gives us some evidence and some, some lends credence to the idea that all of them are coming from outside of our own galaxy. So. Great. Um, Vivi de Vum uh, wants to know if the new large amount of SpaceX satellites will interfere with detections. That is also a very good question. It is very possible. So we already, um, the radio spectrum is, is shared by a lot of people. Um, radio astronomy has a very few, very small protected bands that we operate in. Um, but ideally, we these fast radio bursts, because we know so very little about them, we would really like to observe them over the entire range of possible radio frequencies. We don't fully understand um, their emission yet. We would like to know, do they emit over the entire radio spectrum? Um, how high of frequencies, how low of frequencies? So we, we are actually trying to move outside of those sort of special protected bands to observe these things. And that's where not just um, human-made interference on Earth, but also satellite interference plays a huge role. So already we're very contaminated outside of our protected bands by satellites. Um, but as more and more satellites are launched, uh, they are going to uh, drastically interfere with, with radio observations, particularly if those satellites are, um, you know, like uh, beaming radio emission back to Earth uh, in the form of like trying to, you know, provide like cell service or Wi-Fi or something like that. Um, these could have uh, quite severe effects on the radio interference uh, with our telescopes. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, another question, Juan E is asking, what are your thoughts on Betelgeuse? Oh, 
Um, yeah, so the last that I saw was that Beetlejuice is back up to about 100% of its, uh, of its pre-dip luminosity. So it's, um, you know, it, it faded for a while. It looked like maybe it was fading down to uh, less than 50% of its uh, normal, um, normal luminosity. But I think it's all the way back up to 100% now. So it may have just been um, a, a random variation in, in the star's brightness. So we'll, we'll have to see what happens. <laughs> Uh, back to the SpaceX satellites, uh, Tuanan is pointing that the Starlink operates at 24 gigahertz. So do FRBs peak at around that frequency as well? They do not. For the most part, we observe FRBs around one gigahertz. And um, now we have new telescopes that have been observing them down to, um, so we normally have one gigahertz. And now we're sort of starting to observe them down to roughly 100 megahertz. Um, the highest frequency emission that we've seen from a fast radio burst is around eight gigahertz. Um, but we don't under we don't actually fully know if that's as high as they go or if they go even further. And ideally, we would like to observe at as many radio frequencies as possible to see just what what's the total range of emission that these things give off. So um, we don't normally observe at a, at as high frequencies as twenty four gigahertz, but um, that's, uh, I think it would still be nice to have the option to try to chase these fast radio bursts up to those frequencies and see if they, if they emit there, for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, and Toon Fishbrook is asking, uh, what is the connection to gamma ray bursts? Um, yeah, so we don't know of a distinct connection between fast radio bursts and gamma ray bursts yet. Uh, just for context, gamma ray bursts, there's two types, short and long. Um, short gamma ray bursts are, we think, come from uh, binary neutron star mergers, like Ollie talked about with gravitational waves. Long gamma ray bursts typically come from uh, when, a, when a large massive star goes supernova and forms a black hole, it emits um, sort of a beamed, uh, beamed gamma ray emission at the time of collapse. Uh, we don't really have a good theory for how you could produce an FRB in just a regular stellar explosion, but there are theories that do predict fast radio bursts from binary neutron star mergers, in which case you would see a fast radio burst around the same time as you see a short gamma ray burst. Um, but there haven't been any conclusive links between the two yet. We haven't seen an FRB and a short GRB at the same time from the same source, um, but uh, we're kind of incomplete on the sky in, in that way. The sky is very big and we haven't really been observing with two instruments capable of detecting those two things very often. So it's hard to say for sure whether, um, whether the two are linked, but there are definitely theories that link um, short GRB and fast radio burst uh, emission through binary neutron star mergers. Okay. Uh, and one last question. Hina is asking, how does interferometry help with the detection of FRBs? Yeah, it really helps. Um, so Interferometry is when you combine multiple radio telescopes to um, get more precise localization on the sky. It, it enables you to have higher spatial resolution when you're, when you're observing. Um, so the, the, the upside is you get very high spatial resolution. The downside is that typically um, with traditional interferometers, you also get a very small pinpoint field of view on the sky. So with fast radio bursts, the name of the game is to try to observe as much of the sky for as long as possible. Um, just to get the, you know, to, to, to capitalize on that, that really high um, detect or, you know, incidence rate. But um, with normal interferometers, you're not actually observing that much of the sky. So it's, you have to wait a very long time to hopefully catch fast radio bursts. Um, but if you do catch one, then you can precisely localize it, um, you know, with, with uh, you know, very, very nicely to the point where you can actually see what host galaxy it's coming from. Um, but there are new interferometers coming online now. Um, there's the China telescope in Canada, for example, and the Westerbork telescope that I work on in the Netherlands. And these telescopes combine multiple elements or multiple dishes as an interferometer, but you also get an advantage just the way that they're combined and the way the telescopes are designed. You get a very large field of view on the sky, so you get a high FRB rate. The localization is maybe not as good just because of the way you're combining the data. Um, but you can still do much better than you could do with a um, traditional just a single dish radio telescope. So we're trying to do really creative new types of interferometry to not only find more FRBs, but also localize them a lot better because um, ultimately we want to be able to trace them all back to their host galaxies. That's the, that's the goal. <laughs> yeah. Great, thank you very much. That was a very interesting talk. Um, 
And now we go back to Wendy. Remembering to unmute this time. Uh, great, thank you very much, Emily. Uh, thank you also, Marta, for uh, moderating the questions. That was a, a interesting discussion. Uh, sorry if we had to, to cut it off at some point, if there are more questions. Um, yeah, I just want to say thanks to, to everybody for joining us. Uh, also, Emily, I'm very glad that I didn't introduce you by saying uh, you're talking not about peritons and microwaves. That might have given the game away. Uh, they're very, very interesting stories. Uh, just to advertise, uh, we will be doing an event again at the end of May, 25th of May, once again, streaming live on YouTube. Uh, we'll have Leo and Michelle talking about uh, not just pure astronomy, but very things very close to our hearts, things about the, the climate uh, crisis from an astronomical perspective, uh, and also the the pale blue dot image. Um, so looking forward to that uh, in a month's time and looking forward to seeing many of you online again. Uh, and just to, to advertise, uh, if you are looking for more astronomy uh, to tune into, I know many of the other astronomy on taps in different parts of the world uh, are moving to online events as well. So um, just Google is your friend and also look at astronomyontap.org to see what um, locations there are. Uh, to those of you who might have missed uh, Emily's answer to the tiebreaker question, it was indeed 5,000 FRBs every day. I think that was the question now. Um, and that's the answer. Uh, and to say congratulations to our quiz winners. We did have a team, it seems it was a pair of people uh, who got all the answers right, I think, uh, Ava and Vlad. Um, if you have sent us your email address, we will contact you and hopefully be able to send you a small uh, something astronomical. Uh, and just to mention, we did also have three runners up, uh, Aranka, Cherik, and Pie Eaters, who all got 12 out of 13 for the quiz. Uh, finally, also to say a big thank you to our speakers. Uh, you will both receive a, a keepsake, an Astronomy on Tap light and beer glass. Uh, we'll get these to you uh, as soon as we can. Uh, and very finally, uh, a big thank you not only to everybody who's been online with us tonight, but to everybody in our Astronomy on Tap team. It takes a, a large number of people to, to get this all working reasonably smoothly online uh, so that you can enjoy um, a little bit of astronomy with us. So with that, we'll say thank you uh, and good night. And thank you very much to our audience for, for joining us tonight. Uh, see you next month.